Why is everyone listening to GlobalTalkRadio.com? Because it's the future of talk radio. Every day, more and more people are finding Internet Radio. It's not just an alternative media, but it's a replacement to traditional AM and FM broadcast stations. Internet Radio offers a wider variety of programs, convenient on-demand listening that meets your schedule, and fewer commercial interruptions. And GlobalTalkRadio.com is already leading the way by matching this content with a highly targeted Internet audience. GlobalTalkRadio.com offers its listeners one of the widest programming varieties on the Internet, from business and finance to self-improvement, paranormal, health, literature, romance, politics, and more. There are also opportunities for prospective hosts who would like to host their own weekly or one-time talk shows. Want to learn more? Check us out at www.globaltalkradio.com and see the future of talk radio today. You're listening to globaltalkradio.com. The following program is provided for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed during the show do not necessarily reflect those of the station or the host. There are no guarantees to the information presented in this material, and the claims and results of any cannot be guaranteed. As always, you should consult with a professional before making any decisions that may impact your legal, financial, and medical well-being. And now, the best of Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome. Are you ready to take a journey with me into knowledge, enlightenment, and discovery? Then let's journey again together. This is your host, Rebecca Jernigan, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Good. What a lovely Thursday evening this is. I have a most marvelous guest with us tonight. He is the author of God at the Seat of Life, a very interesting topic, Salmon. And we're going to talk to him in this segment here in just a moment. The first is I do every if you will, tune in to my website, at journeyrebecca.com, and under Journey to all the latest information. And uh, also, I'd like to take this opportunity, as I do every week, to thank my sponsor, Fate Magazine. Um, for those of you who have not had that address before, that's www.fatemag.com. What a lovely group of people that would be happy to help you out. They'll send you out a copy of the magazine before you can uh, do a subscription. They're really great, so definitely get a hold of those people or visit their website. Also, I want to Turn your attention to our world news. Um, as I do in every week, there is always the newest and latest uh, information that I put up under our world news. And there's direct links where you can just go and click on. You can look at those articles for yourself. But, you know, at this time in our society, in our world, um, with all the weather changes, the earth changes, um, people's behaviors, societies as a whole, this is a very, very volatile time in our world. And as people, we need my belief is we need to be a little bit more conscious of each other as human beings because we can get caught up in all of the hype and all of the sensationalism that there is going on in the news. But I would advise you to check your heart and if it feels like it's something that's worth your time or your effort, then certainly look into it. But don't always get caught up in all the sensationalism. Look at what's really important. When we get into be talking to our guests tonight, we're going to be talking about some of those same issues. But back to our world news for just a moment. Um, I'm Japan stands skies, that's one of them. Glacial, volcanic activity on Mars, they have some images there. I think that's really fascinating. And I think one of the most fascinating articles I read this week was European scientists believe that there is life on Mars. Um, you know, as of from last week, when we did that whole um, expose with my guest last week of Mark Kimmel, we were talking about that kind of very same thing. You know, this world, our world is a very small place indeed when we look at the sky out there and the cosmos and all the... Um, you know, all the exploration that's going on, and we are discovering more and more and more each and every day about what's going on in the universes out there. And I think it's quite tremendous. When we talk to our guests tonight, and we really get into all those factors, I think we're going to have a really fascinating show. And I'd like to remind you, too, to if you have a question or you have um, a comment or you want to post any pictures, please email me, mailbag at journeyswithrebecca.com, or if you'd like to get a hold of me for any other reason, rebecca at journeyswithrebecca.com. And as a last note here before we get to the guest, if you have any difficulties on the website, please um, contact webmaster at journeyswithrebecca.com. And I'd like to take this opportunity now and have Lee uh, Bauman, MD, join us. Dr. Bauman, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and uh, I am thrilled to be here tonight. Well, you know, I cannot tell you, I, we, we've talked a few times on the phone prior to tonight, and I, when I read your book, I got your book, and I couldn't hardly put it down. Of course, I had to because there were other things going on. But what I find is that God is the speed of light. In the back of your book, it's the melding of science and spirituality. And when I 
when I received your book, I thought, well, now, either this is not going to be very good or it's going to be totally fascinating. And I found it to be the latter. Totally fascinating book. Well, thank you. And um, just quickly, before we have to go to break here, um, one of you, um, you were a medical consultant in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's right. And you've been a medical director of health maintenance organization and a biology instructor. Right. And let's see, you hold your board certified in internal medicine, geriatrics, and medical management. Correct. I can hardly wait to find out why you have written such a most fascinating book about um, God at the speed of life. Um, I think that's just absolutely fascinating. Um, before we go to break, why don't you tell everybody just in a few brief words, really what is the whole premise of your book, God at the speed of life? Uh, basically, the book tells about how uh, after 20 years of research that I came to be a believer in God basically because uh, of the scientific evidence that showed a, a very intimate link between God and life. All right, hang on to that, and we'll be right back. Don't go away. Schedule your private psychic reading with Rebecca, a truly gifted, intuitive, and clairvoyant, and the host of Journeys with Rebecca radio show. Call 1-888-958-2768. That's 1-888-958-2768. Where will your life's journey take you? Welcome back, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. We're here with my guest, C. Lee Bauman, M.D., Talking about his book, God is the Speed of Light, it is the melding of science and spirituality. And at the last break, we kind of got cut off there before you were able to finish, Dr. Bauman, about you, how you came to believe in God after you said you were doing medicine for about 20 years and you started to believe in God at that point and science. Well, actually, having uh, completed uh, my biology training in college where the scientific method is be- beaten into your head and then going through medical school, uh, I, I really found myself to be a religious skeptic at that point. But I, uh, around uh, the time just before I graduated from medical school, I developed a really keen interest in Einstein's theories of relativity and of quantum physics. And uh, then, strangely enough, uh, an Alabama native uh, by the name of Raymond Moody came out with his landmark book on the near-death experience. So uh, being a physician myself, I, you know, I found... Uh, Moody from his physician perspective and Einstein from his scientific perspective, I found, you know, both of them very credible and the ideas that they, they posed were, uh, were just fascinating. Too. Well, I think your, your book in the back of it, the, one of the questions on the back of the book in the little excerpt it gives, it says, what if our increasing knowledge in both science and spirituality is pointing us all in the same direction? I really think that that was the line for myself personally that kind of caught my attention. And in your book, um, you know, obviously being uh, a medical doctor, you, you know, you see a lot of people who are not well. And, you know, you watch them go through the process of, of life right. as, they, as they grow older. And, and, of course, a lot of them have passed over. In your book, you have talked a, a lot about, um, well, you've carefully chosen, as you said, um, things about the near-death experiences. How does that all kind of flow into this? Because I think near-death experiences... Um, are absolutely a, not just a fascinating subject, but I've, I've actually been privy to um, many people around me and as myself as, that have experienced that. Right. Well, actually, in my own practice, having uh, you know, found myself, unfortunately, uh, resuscitating patients, uh, you know, you, you always wondered, you know, what was going on, uh, if anything, in, in the conscious or semi-conscious uh, brain activity of these people. And there was no uh, scientific evidence out there to give us any lead or direction in that until Moody's book came out. Uh, and, of course, one of the main uh, elements in the near-death experience happens to be the element of light. And actually, Melvin Morse, who wrote another book dealing with near-death experiences of children, actually claimed that he felt uh, the element of light was actually the most critical element in the near-death experience. So, now, when we're, you know, talking I, of, when we're talking about the light, you're talking about not just the physicality of light, but the light that people claim that they're they're in or they see or they're a part of. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Well? Yeah, well, when they go through the tunnel after they've uh, basically gone to the other side, uh, they claim to see light, and along with the light are these intense emotions and feelings of warmth, peace, love. And many of the people identify the light with God or if they were Christians with Christ, and if they were atheists, just as a uh, guiding spirit. 
Well, so that I'd was like to, my introduction to life. Well, I'd like to share my experience. I myself um, actually had one. I was in my 20s, and uh, I was actually having an operation performed, and I was under anesthesia, and I remember um, being in the light. I don't remember the tunnel. I just remember darkness and a feeling of movement, and then I ended up in this light, and this light was a golden light. It wasn't yellow. It was the true golden light, and I remember... I remember being in this light thinking, what a warm, beautiful place. It's indescribable. Absolutely. I mean, there's just no words. We don't have any in our English language to just to really communicate what that felt like, what that experience was. Amazing. And I didn't see anyone, but I knew that there were people in the light. Really? Because I sensed their presence. Because right. I had some, um, some family members that had passed over at that point. And I knew that they were there. And I could, I could hear their thoughts in my head. And they were all very encouraging to me. Um, you know, very, very loving. Um, a lot of them, unlike their personality when they were in human form. Right. But, you know, you sense the love, you, and I sense the information they were giving me. But every one of them, without fail, told me it wasn't my time and I needed to go back. And I remember, I remember being stubborn as I am. I said, oh, oh no, no, I don't want to do that. It's very nice here. And said, that's yeah, so but you typical. have things to do. <laughs> right. So I came back. I came out of the anesthesia during the middle of it, too, by the way. That was kind of freaky. Oh, boy. <laughs> The doctors didn't quite know what to do with me at that point. <laughs> but, but so many of the elements you describe are just so, you know, typical of uh, the classic uh, near-death experience. Well, and, you know, I shared that with a few people. And of course, you know, that's been many, many, many years ago now when that experience happened to me. And people then just kind of looked at me like, okay. You know, like I was, they just, nobody could really wrap their mind around it. And then eventually I found people like myself that had had those experiences. And we're just, it was quite phenomenal. Just, I was like, oh, good, I really am not alone in the world. Yeah, and it was such a revealing experience to, you know, actually have a uh, credible physician who was also a philosopher actually, you know, put these cases down in print and lend credibility to the uh, the whole experience. You know, absolutely. And it's unfortunate that sometimes we have to have that kind of credibility in order for people to take notice of it. But it's so valuable that they do that. And I'm, I'm really pleased with, with the way your book came out and some of these experiences that were in there, that was phenomenal. Well, you thank know, you. I, I, I know, you know, at that time in my life, as I mentioned, I was still a skeptic. And even even after having read that, I, you know, I thought, well, maybe there's something here. But uh, I I wasn't convinced uh, until I began to put one and one together. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with Einstein's theories of relativity, uh, there's so much scientific support of actual supernatural uh, traits to physical life, and that was really the, uh, I guess, the, the various concepts that brought me across the line and convinced me that, indeed, maybe light and God uh, had a very intimate uh, relationship going. And, and, and they're all part of the one, or the yes. same, I guess is a good way of saying that. Right. All part of one and the same. Um, and, well, you know, let's. I want to talk about your chapters in your book for just a minute. I think it was kind of interesting when I opened it up. Chapter number one is called Adventures in Death. And I thought, oh, that's kind of bizarre. And I started reading it, and it was nothing like I thought it was at all. And then your next chapter goes on and talks about the light, which is really what we've just gotten to talking about, right. is that whole concept. But some of the things that I wanted to kind of go over is the next chapter was faster than a speeding bullet. Well, That I, one is a scientific kind of chapter there. Right. Well, there are so many uh, just fascinating traits and really incredible traits to, to physical light. and. Uh, I, probably the best capsule that I could uh, describe would, is what I call the three omni. Uh, they stand for uh, omnipresence, which means that you know something can be everywhere at one time. Omniscience, which basically means that uh, something is all knowing, and omnipotence, which means that something is all powerful. And those are actually proven attributes to physical light, which also happen to be. Uh, ways that God is described in every major text throughout the world. Uh, and, and I can go into detail with each of those if, uh, you know, if we have the time. Sure, go right ahead. I, I, find, it, I find all three of those. That's very kind of uh, Let's go. Well, well, what I like, I usually start out with the fact that uh, Einstein showed that when you're traveling at light speed, that time actually stops. And again, this has been proven time and time again uh, in, in the physics uh, arena. And if, if you think about it, what that means is that light can travel basically from one corner of the universe to the other corner, and time does not elapse. And, and if you expand 
that concept and keeping in mind the whole time that that uh, time uh, does not exist really for the light wave. Many physicists uh, summarize that attribute by saying, you know, theoretically, that light wave can be everywhere in the universe at once. And that basically is, is what equates to the omnipresence or the ability to be everywhere. And again, it's uh, an attribute you know, often uh, used to describe God. And the second omni is a direct uh, corollary to that omnipresence or you know, the ability of light to be everywhere. Uh, and that's the omniscient or the all-knowing counterpart. And at this time, it's probably good to point out that many people who've had near-death experiences, when they've been in the presence of the light, also feel that they've had the answers to everything in the universe, you know, at that time. Uh, they, they can't bring it back with them when they return, but at the time, they remember that they knew everything. But uh, the scientific argument of that is if you think about it, if, if you are an entity in the universe, which is everywhere at one time, and for whom the past is no different from the present, is no different, no different from the future. Basically, that entity knows everything that has ever transpired in any corner or crevice of the universe, you know, dating back to the beginning of time and going forward into the future. And so that, that basically equates to, you know, absolute knowledge. So that's where the omniscience, or the second omniscience, and the third one is a little more complex, and I won't go into the complexities, other than to say that uh, physicists have had to resort to a specific technique in, in the uh, quantum physics arena uh, because of uh, whenever they've tried to perform calculations of quantum particles, things like electrons, uh, atoms, they kept coming up with infinities in their equations, and they couldn't figure out why. Uh, but to make a long story short, the infinities were coming from light. And they had to develop a technique which uh, goes by the name of renormalization for anyone who wishes to get on the Internet and look that up. But it's uh, the word normal with re in front of it. Uh, renormalization is, is the uh, term for that technique. So that basically encompasses three arms of light, which are all identical uh, to descriptions of God uh, throughout the world's major literature. So that was really, those were really the major concepts which started me on the path to realizing that uh, maybe science did have a valid argument for the existence of a higher intelligence in the world. My feeling right now is that God is manifesting his or herself to humanity, you know, through these, uh, through these attributes of life. I'm uh, kind of speechless here. Um, I've, you know, obviously I've heard all those terms before. I just don't think I've actually heard anybody uh, put it together quite so succinctly and eloquently. So uh, that was a really good explanation on all three of those terms because I do believe there's a little misconception out there as to really what those terms meant when we are talking in the terms that we're talking about. Well, that's true. And, and the, uh, the concepts are nice. We'll be right back, Simple. though. Don't go away. Check out Rebecca's website for the latest Journeys news and more. Log on to www.journeyswithrebecca.com. Welcome back, and you are listening to Journeys. We are here with Dr. Lee, T. Lee Bauman, talking about God's speed of light. We had a wonderful, fascinating um, interview at the first part of this. I'm just, just so thrilled to have you here and all the information that we're gathering. But one of the things that you, we kind of wanted that we talked about uh, um, in between the break is one of the things that we want to discuss is light displays attributes of consciousness. Correct. I would love to hear that whole theory and concept there. Well, it's uh, it's a, uh, again, most of these concepts are not simple, but uh, I, I think I can explain it uh, in relative layman or layperson terms. That would be what, real good. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, physicists found uh, many years ago, and, and again, uh, physicists have known about these type of things now for decades, and just the rest of us who are just now beginning to learn about them, but uh, the attribute of consciousness with light comes about from a series of experiments known as the double slit experiment, that's double hyphen slit experiment, uh, and related uh, experiments, which were, were all performed because physicists and the researchers couldn't believe the results of these experiments, so they kept them 
modifying them. They kept trying to figure out ways that, you know, their experimental setup was flawed, and they kept repeating the experiments, and the experiments kept showing the same thing. And and this is where I will I will try to explain it in, in light Christian terms. Uh, but, but the conclusion is that light is displaying conscious uh, traits. What uh, the experimenters found was that they would release a single light wave into the experimental setup, and they knew uh, what would happen to the, the light wave, or what physicists call a photon. They knew what would happen to the photon in the experiment, and what would happen at the end of the experiment. Now, the confusion came about when they would alter one of the last uh, sets in the experimental design. And when they made this modification, and again, this, this was a, a change at the very end of the experiment, they saw, again, the photon would enter the experimental setup, and right in the middle of the experiment, not at the end where everyone was expecting the change to occur, but actually in the middle of the experiment, light altered its uh, course of action from the uh, previous experiment. It actually anticipated changes in the experiment before it even reached them and altered its course of action. And physicists were just flabbergasted. They could not explain it. Uh, and so they began you know, uh, changing the experiment. They began uh, performing all sorts of new experiments with different designs. And the results kept coming out the same. Light was actually, uh, they perceived it as anticipating, predicting changes at the end of the experiment and actually altering its behavior right back in the middle of the experiment. You know, just uh, just an incredible uh, series of events. But if, if you think about the three omnis that I mentioned earlier, the fact that time does not exist for the light wave, what physicists actually found out what light was doing was that it was actually going to the end of the experiment, uh, recognizing the change, going back in time, and altering its course of action to what we humans perceive as being in the middle of the experiment. Does any of that make sense, what I just said? It actually, it did. I was following it. I, 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 I hear in pictures, believe it or not, so I'm actually picturing all of this while you're talking. Okay, well, good. I, so that, because, so, because it's, not often, it's not often easy to, uh, you know, to perceptualize, but, uh, but that was what physicists were saying, and uh, really, when you think about it, light was just acting retroactively in time, and we humans were perceiving it as anticipating changes you know, at the end of the experiment where we humans actually saw the light changing in the middle of the experiment. So uh, so some physicists have actually termed that uh, a form of consciousness with light. And it's just, just that. Well, yeah, you know, let, let, let's carry that just a little bit further because now my little brain is on fire here. Um, if, 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 if what you're saying is, is you know, is true, if that, if that whole experiment is true, then... And light is a conscious thing. It, in other words, it has its, its own, I hate to say thought processes, but it has its own actions that act independently. Exactly, yeah. Then, then there are things that may be going on in this world today that's actually almost in the past. Well, if, well that's if, right. If, if, we were, if we were to term that in past, present, and future in relation to that experiment. Well, that, yes. That, that light was supposed to change at the end, but instead it's changed in the middle, but it had already been there and came back. Well, I know, and you know, it, it offers such a perfect explanation for a lot of uh, what we call supernatural psychic events. You know, whatever you want to call them, uh, things that we cannot normally explain, and suddenly using light as the prime example. Uh, you know, because there's a scientific basis for it. And there are actual physics experiments that you can cite. You know, to support these findings. Suddenly, you know, we've got good reason to believe that. Some of these things are, are true and are really happening, like psychic events, uh, supernatural events. Certainly not all of them, but it, it, it offers an explanation. It'll make you look at the world it. differently, though. I'm sorry? It'll make you look at the world differently. Now, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at my day going, what was it that I could have experienced if they well, yes. come from the, the past or, or the future and come back? Well, exactly. I mean, things like that's past what life deja vu is. You know. Maybe that's deja vu. I think that's, you know, one, of, that's one of the... Uh, uh, phenomenon that I often discuss in my uh, talks is, yes, I, I think that's a good example. I think that would be a perfect example of deja vu. Uh -huh. And as a psychic myself, you know, people ask me, well, how do you do that? And I'm like, I don't know, it's just there. Right. I mean, 
mean, it's not like I have a, a some kind of a step-by-step process in order to get there. Oh, my goodness. Hang on, and we'll be right back with more of Journeys and Dr. Bauman in just a moment. Hi, this is Rebecca Jernigan, host of Journeys with Rebecca. As a truly gifted psychic and clairvoyant, let me help answer your life's questions. Schedule your personal and private reading appointment with me. Call 1-888-958-2768 or log on to www.journeyswithrebecca.com. Where will your life's journey lead you? Email Rebecca with your comments to mailbag at journeyswithrebecca.com. You're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome back, and we are here talking with Dr. Lee Bauman. Dr. Bauman, we have had some of the most fascinating conversations, the omnis, the um, light display attributes of consciousness. We talked a great deal about that. One of the other things in your book that you have um, given quite a lot of, um, I guess, attention to is something you call the grand design. Yes. Well, I'd love to hear about the grand design. Well, the grand design is something where there are just so many examples that uh, you're going to have to let, let me know when my time is up because I'll, I will just get started and often it's hard to stop. But, That's uh, okay. The, uh, probably the first uh, example that I would list is uh, comes from the second law of thermodynamics, which is also known uh, in the physics community by the name of entropy. That's E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. And entropy is a well-accepted uh, law in physics that states that as time goes on, that the universe, our world, our daily lives become more disorganized. And, and we can probably all relate to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, our computers freeze up, our computers break down, our chair, a leg falls off, or our, uh, you know, erosion in the soil uh, causes us to have to go and work in the front yard. Th- these are all examples of entropy. And, again, it, it's a well-accepted law. Now, if you look back to how your world appeared yesterday. Uh, The law of entropy states that the world, the universe, were just a little bit more orderly or more organized yesterday than it was today. And if you go back a week ago, the same holds true, except even more so. And what cosmologists and scientists and physicists tell us is if we keep going back in time, especially if we go all the way back to the very moment of the birth of the universe, uh, which most physicists call the Big Bang. If we look at that moment and relate it to the, to the law of entropy, what we find is that this law states that an infinite, an infinite amount of organization, orderliness, design, existed at the moment of the Big Bang. So this is just one of many uh, laws of nature, and in this uh, instance it's a law of physics, which, you know, states categorically that at the beginning of creation that there was design there, and in this case, an infinite amount of it. Now, I've been jotting numbers down to the various uh, concepts, and what I picked is the second concept uh, to go along with uh, arguments for a grand design is the fossil record. So we're getting away from physics here and getting into archaeology and geology, but, you know, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution was something that always bothered me uh, from a scientific and biologic standpoint, uh, because it basically was an argument against God. You know, there was no reason to have God around because uh, scientists were saying that life could occur with, without him or her. And, you know, I think that's something which uh, causes a lot of people to question whether a higher thing truly exists. But what geologists now have determined after having looked at the fossil record here for the last century is that uh, the Cambrian era was the major era in uh, evolution, if you want to call it that, where most of life exploded into all the biologic diversity that we see. But if you look at the fossil record, what you find is that the fossil record identifies that this explosion of the Cambrian uh, diversity of life occurred within about a five million year period of time. But according to Darwin's theory of evolution, if you look at how uh, such diversity must have evolved if, you know, Darwin was right uh, with all the gene mutations and everything that are necessary for that. Uh, these, these researchers have determined 
that for the diversity that we saw in the Cambrian era, hundreds of millions of years would have been necessary. So th this is just really a totally different perspective on a totally different uh, issue, which uh, from a scientific basis states that Darwin's theory of evolution could not explain the diversity of life which we currently see here on planet Earth. So I found that fascinating, and uh, you know, just additional support for why uh, suddenly God became necessary. The, the third concept uh, is what I call the Alpha and Omega. And in this concept, we know that God and Christ are often described as the Alpha and Omega in the Bible and various other uh, uh, religious texts. And if we look scientifically, and again, we're going back to light now with this comparison, but if we look scientifically at the Big Bang, which would be the Alpha, scientists and physicists tell us that one of the major constituents, one of the first constituents of the Big Bang was light. So hence we have the Alpha. If we look at the Omega, which would basically mean the end of the universe, then what we also find is that light is one of the last vestiges of our dying universe, if it's the ever-expanding scenario that many physicists argue, or even if it's the collapsing universe, which collapses in on itself, what we find is, again, in either you know last-day scenario of our universe, light is one of the final remnants. So we have light representing the Alpha and Omega, just, uh, again, similar to uh, some of the other descriptions of God that I related earlier. And if we have time, I can go into my fourth concept. Well, I, we're not out of time quite yet on this segment. Whatever we don't get, we can certainly pick up on the next one. Okay, good. Uh, this, this next concept is uh, basically the Earth's position in our solar system. Uh, and, again, a, a fairly complex uh, concept, which, which I will simplify. What cosmologists tell us is whenever planets form about a central star, so you have, you know, this, this cloud of dust circulating around a star. And computer models show that the planets form in a very specific pattern about that star. And the pattern is the first planet uh, forms at distance x from the star. The second planet forms at distance 2x from the star. And then it goes on. Each succeeding planet, it would then be 4x, 8x, 16x. The distance is keep double. Okay, hang on to that thought. And, we'll and I, I will finish that up this in a moment. Talk with an intuitive touch. Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome back. God is of Light, as presented by Dr. Bauman. And Dr. Bauman, we had to kind of cut you off on that last one. And uh, before the end of this uh, segment, we're going to let everybody know where they can get this book and how to reach you. But let's go ahead and get into that concept, if we can, about where we left off the two times the four times. Right. Uh, yeah, just to recap, I was uh, discussing how uh, computer models showed that planets formed in a particular pattern around the central star. And first planet is at 1x the second planet, 2x, and then they keep going out, doubling the distance uh, as you continue. And what we find with our own solar system, our planet fits that example so eloquently, except for two exceptions. And one are the, the farthest planets uh, out there, which uh, would be Pluto, and actually I think they've actually found another planet even beyond Pluto at this point. And if you talk to uh, astronomers, they will actually argue that Pluto and some of the more outermost planets beyond Pluto are really not planets at all. Often uh, they argue that they're uh, comets which have become captured by the sun's gravitational force or even escaped moons from some of the larger planets like uh, Neptune, Saturn, one of those. So if, if you exclude Pluto, all the planets fit that pattern of doubling their distances from the central star or the sun with the other exception being that of planet Earth. Planet Earth should theoretically not be in the solar system, period. I mean, there is uh, there's Mercury, there's Venus, and there's Mars, and there should not be a planet between Venus and Mars. And, you know, from a spiritual and uh, uh, godly uh, perspective, 
you have to question, isn't it amazing that our planet just happened to be placed where no planet should exist, and it just happens to be at the right location from the sun where liquid water exists, and it's the only planet where liquid water exists on the surface of the planet, which has allowed for life to form. So that, that's one of uh, one of the major minor concepts that I always like to bring up because it's just uh, you know incredible that here we are with the only planet with you know our life forms in anyway, and uh, and the planet shouldn't be. Well, and that was one of the things we talked about when we were on break was that was the concept in your book that just really kind of blew my mind. That's all part of this grand design. That's what we right. started this whole thing with was the grand design. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> call it a miracle, call it whatever you want, but as you have stated, um, and, and, you know, we've explored these other planets. We know that they're not habitable for at least human beings right. that we're aware of at this time or, or life forms such as ours, um, but yet here we are. Um, as you stated, in a scientific manner, and we, you know, if you put the numbers together, that number of planet Earth in that whole concept shouldn't be there or it doesn't fit into the equation. Well, well and that's just such a good uh, example because there are so many other uh, instances just like that in our universe, you know, the laws of nature. Uh, you know, if, if they were anything other than what they were, there wouldn't be life anywhere. Exactly. It, it just seems phenomenal, and I think, even from a scientific perspective, if you study this, uh, there are more arguments for why life should not exist than for why life does exist. And, and I think and we shouldn't take it a, for granted. Yeah, I think it comes down to a creative. Exactly. Well, before we run out of time, first of all, I'd like to say what a delight this has been. I know we've covered a lot of the book, but as a person that's read your book, this book has got so much more information than we can possibly cram in in the time that we have. Can you tell everyone how they can get a copy of your book, Dr. Bauman? Oh, I can, and you know, I certainly want to thank you for having me on. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, oh, I have absolutely enjoyed this. But uh, the book can be purchased at uh, Amazon.com, Walmart.com, BarnesNoble.com. Would probably be some of the ones I would recommend. Do you have a particular website or? Well, I do. Uh, if you go to Writers, W-R-I-T-E-R-S, Writers.net. Uh, it would probably be easiest just to go to that website and search for Bauman or search for God at the Speed of Light, and, uh, and it'll come up and actually lead you to the Amazon site. And I do want to let everyone know, too, Dr. Bauman, is after this show airs, you will be in my uh, past guest list, which is always on my website. And that's an honor, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm sweet of you to say that. <laughs> but you'll be there, and their link will always remain active, so they can always go in there, find out where to get the copy of the book or how to contact you. Oh, wonderful. Um, this has been um, God at the Speed of Light, The Melding of Science and Spirituality. Again, um, we have talked an awful lot about your book, but obviously we just, we've only just touched just, just some of the highlights that went on here. Um, you know, you've talked a lot in there um, in, about the Bible and how it relates to near-death experiences that we didn't get into. Um, also, there's a really neat poem in the back that celebrates um, death as opposed to grieving over it. Um, it was a very fascinating poem. I, I commend you for putting that in the book. Um, that's a brave thing to do because as humans, we do fear it. Yes, we do. When those that have the near-death experiences, they, they realize how beautiful it really is. Exactly. Um, it does make us treasure our time here um, on the earth. And which is something I started out with my whole show on the whole premise that we do need to be very cognizant that we are a spirit having human experience. So, and again, Dr. Bauman, thank you so much. Thank you. you. And blessings to each and every one of you. I'd like to thank my guests tonight for sharing their wonderful information and knowledge with us. And a special thanks goes out to you, the listeners. Now, you know, the guests I have on air are given the opportunity to share their viewpoints or ideas. Now, you and I have the opportunity of choice in regards to those ideas or viewpoints. Be sure to check in next week for more enlightening educational talk and discovery. This is Rebecca of Journeys with Rebecca. Until we meet again, where will your life's journey take you? Many blessings and good night.